All right, so Mary gives birth to the baby. This was like, uh, it was not easy stuff. Like, you know, they couldn't afford uh, a room at the embassy suites. The Motel 6 was all booked up for the night. So they had to go find themselves uh, a barn. Now, the corner drugstore was out of epidurals. All the midwives were on uh, vacation. And think about this, like these two teenagers uh, were all by themselves. Now, you drive through people's uh, the neighborhoods and you see these nativity sets, and I will guarantee you uh, what it was like on that silent night was nothing like what you see in people's yards. You know, there had to be blood, there had to be pain, uh, there had to be tears, there had to be fears. All these things were certainly present. Um, but out of Mary's agony uh, was born this fragile little child. And when this fragile little child was born, the world was never quite the same again. A worn out Mary, she, uh, she had to look into the eyes of her baby. Uh, I don't know if she saw green, I don't know if she saw brown, I don't know if she saw blue, but I do know that when she looked into the eyes of the baby, she saw the light of the world. She uh, uh, held from her breast the one who would one day defeat and destroy death. Uh, she, um, she held in her arms the one who would be the resurrection and the life. Now Mary experienced Christmas like no one has ever experienced Christmas before. His official name is Emmanuel, which translates from the Hebrew, God is with us. And there is no one that has ever experienced God being with them like Mary did on that day. Now it was uh, dark outside. Joseph, he couldn't find a plug-in for the incubator, so he had to build himself uh, a fire. Now the symbolism of this fire is, is beautiful. All of a sudden, the warm light was replacing the dark cold, and it was a sign of things to come. Now the baby uh, would become a boy, the boy would become a man. And near the end of his life, what would happen is the blood, the pain, the agony, the tears, and the fears, they would return. And again, the world would never be the same again. As a baby, Jesus laid in a wooden manger. As a man, he hung on a cross. His death is our life, both abundant life in this world and eternal life in the world to come. Now this is the greatest story ever told. There's no exceptions to this. In the early part of uh, Luke chapter two, there's a little known thing that we kind of pass over a lot of times, and that's this thing called uh, a census. Now what the census meant in this culture at this time was that all the male heads of household had to take their family back to the city where they were born. The government would do a head count. This wasn't something you would do online. It wasn't something that would take a few hours. This would be something that would take uh, weeks, if not months. Uh, it's a stressful time. Like you've left somewhere before and a lot of times you have work to do or you have things to do around the house and people had to get ready. You know, it's tough enough sometimes for us to travel. Back then, most of their travel was done on donkey or uh, by walking. Uh, one of the interesting things about the census, it was almost like a forced uh, family reunion because what would happen is all the men would go back to their town. It'd be a, a reunion with their parents, their brothers, their sisters, their friends, and their family. Now, we know this about the census. We know that it was stressful. We know that uh, it was demanding. We know that people were busy. Now, during this busyness, during this stress, during these demands, there was a baby born. And Luke tells us that pretty much everybody was oblivious besides a few shepherds. Now I wanna fast forward uh, to 2014. And I don't really think that times are too much different today than they were back then. I think there's this baby that was born and I think that many of us are oblivious and, and it's like there's this census that's going on for us today. We're busy people. You know, I know most of y'all, and, and you're busy people. I'm a busy person. You know, some wear busyness is almost like a, a badge of honor. Like, if I'm not busy, if my day isn't scheduled, uh, if I don't have a lot of demands on my time, then for some reason I must be insignificant and my life must be meaningless. Now, in addition to busyness, uh, 
I know that some of y'all deal with a lot of stress. You know, you know what stress is. It's just outside factors, um, you know, messing us up on the inside, and there's stress that exists in our lives. This happens in our minds. It happens in our bodies, and it happens in our soul. And you know if you're under stress for too long, like, it does all three of these things. Uh, jobs cause us stress. School causes us stress. Uh, for some of you, it's parents that cause you stress. For some of us, it's uh, kids that cause the stress. There's peer pressure. There's financial pressure. There, there's health concerns. All these things, whatever. Busyness and stress are part of our life. And, and let's pile on like the demands of daily living. You know, if the busyness and if the stress weren't enough, let's add the demands of daily living to what we're looking at. Now, many of us would say that our daily responsibilities exceed um, our resources that we have to complete these responsibilities. You know, some of us, you know too well what it's like to have a census taken. You, know, you have people telling you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Maybe it's a, a coach or a teacher. Maybe it's an employer or a customer. Maybe it's a bank that you owe money to. Maybe it's a school that uh, you send your kid to. Now, you know, you know about that. I know about these things. Uh, I remember a day, this is you know, four or five years ago, I was out uh, golfing with uh, three friends of mine. And I kept getting this call, and it called like two or three times in just a few minutes, and my friends were like insisting that I answer the call. And uh, the guy called me up. I didn't recognize the name or the number. His name was Jimmy. He says, hey, Craig, it's Jimmy. And I'm like just being polite. Hey, Jimmy, how's it going? Is it going good. Are you on your way? I'm like, am I on my way to what? He says, dude, you better not be messing with me. I said, I'm sorry, like, am I supposed to be somewhere? And he says, you're doing my wedding in 10 minutes. <laughs> All of a sudden, you talk about stress and anxiety and busyness. Uh, and I'm like, I'm sorry, did, did we talk about this? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, we talked about this like six months ago. You put it on your calendar. And I'm like, well, where's the wedding? And so uh, it's at Elmwood Park. I'm like, Dude, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm like an hour away. Like, even if I, I'm not available right now, if I went home and changed, like, I could get there, but it's an hour from now. Now, all of a sudden, like, he's mad. And he's like, dude, like, the harpist is playing, and, you know, they got all these flowers out, and I'm supposed to do one thing, and that's find you. Like, I am, like, totally sick to my stomach at this point. And uh, he says, you got to get down here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to beat you up. And I'm like, I, I'm a pastor. He says, well, you better be praying. <laughs> so I hang up the phone and like, seriously, I was, I was, I was ready to throw. I had never, like, I was just, it was crazy. And then like the guys I was looking at, like they're all looking at me and they're trying not to laugh. And they said, so I assume Jimmy got a hold of you, right? <laughs> so these guys, I had played some practical jokes on them. Um, and they got me better than I've ever gotten before. <laughs> I was so relieved, but I was so angry simultaneously, and um, I'm not friends with either of these three men anymore. <laughs> I went home and defriended them on Facebook and blocked them and all that sort of stuff. Now, that story is actually uh, your story as well. Not at Tiburon Golf Course, Jimmy wasn't on the other line. But there's been times in your life, and maybe that time is right now when you're just like totally maxed out, like you got nothing left. Um, you know, it's, maybe it's busyness, maybe it's stress, maybe it's demands, maybe it's all of the above, maybe it's some of the above. Um, you know, this is not the way that God intends for us to live. Now, what's really interesting is regardless of the busyness, regardless of the stress, regardless of the demands, there's powerful good news. The word gospel, it, it means good news. And the good news is this. Uh, Jesus' name is Emmanuel. It, which means that uh, God is with us. Now, in your busyness, in your demands, in your stress, God is with you. Now, do you believe this? Do you believe that God is with you? And, and if you do believe this, does it make a difference? Now, uh, a couple years ago, my little guy David was uh, being picked on at school. Someone was calling him a name, and he said, like, what? Well, I said, what name are they calling you? And uh, they were calling him uh, David Ficklefart. Um, <laughs> Kind of sounds like my last name, not really, but kind of. And he did not like this at all. Um, and I said, well, can you go somewhere else and I'll, uh, you know, pick you up and maybe we can deal with it that way or have you told the teacher and all that sort of stuff. And it was time to, you know, pick him up the next day and he had kind of been instructed to go uh, 
you know, stand somewhere else where this older kid wasn't going to be able to, uh, you know, talk to him. And, you know, Benjamin went with me. Benjamin would have been in sixth grade at the time. And he got out of the car and he went and started, you know, talking to some of the kids. And I wasn't really paying attention. I was actually busy and distracted and, you know, going through my email and my iPad while I just sat there in the car. And all of a sudden I noticed Benjamin was talking to this kid and David was there too. And, you know, Benjamin was, uh, you know, chatting and they all came back in the car and uh, Benny and David were there. And I said, what were you talking to that kid about? And he says, well, that was that kid that was uh, calling David, David Fickle Fart. I said, well, what did you say to him? He said, well, let's just say I gave him a lesson in Norwegian pronunciation. <laughs> I said, what did he say? He said, Finisted. He said, he's not going to be calling him Fickle Fart anymore. And I said, well, it wasn't a very, you know, talk to him for a while. I mean, what else did you say? I said, well, you know, there's basically just one person who has authority to pick on my little brother, and it wasn't him, it's me. So, you know, you need to leave this kid alone. Now, think about this. Like, David goes to school the next day and the next day and the next day, um, and guess what? The bully is still there. The kid is still there, but now he has got the presence of his big brother. Now, maybe you'll come here today and... I really hope, and I really hope you can embrace that God is with you. But even more so, I, I think there's something, even, I mean, God is a whole lot better than a big brother because your bullies are still going to exist. Even if we embrace that God is with us, your bullies are still going to exist. Maybe it's uh, anxiety. Maybe it's some broken relationships. Maybe it's being overwhelmed. Maybe it's challenging health. Maybe it's consequences from our uh, past mistakes. Maybe it's uh, depression. Maybe it's difficult people. Those bullies are still going to exist in the world, but God is with us. And the good news is that God is bigger than our bullies. The good news is that with God, there, there, there is nothing that we can't do. Now, the thing that we need most in life is what? It, it's God. It's his presence. It's God being with us. But, but our busyness, our distractions, our demands, and our stress are like this clutter that stand and create this wall between us and God. Now, tonight we are going to uh, conclude our series. We're in the fifth week of a five-week uh, sermon series called uh, Christmas in the Movies. And we're going to watch now uh, a short clip from the movie Elf. I don't know what you're making such a big deal about. They were just having a little fun. Fun. So felonies are fun now. I thought, see, felonies were felonies. Okay, the tree thing was bad. I'll get him to plan another one. But at least Michael is happy for once. What, uh, what's that supposed to mean? Well, I don't think it's any secret, Walter, that you haven't exactly been there for him. I'll tell you what, well, why don't we just pull him out of school and let the uh, deranged elf man raise him? Then they can have lots of fun committing felonies. How are we going to get the star on top? I got it. So this is really one of the few parts of the movie that isn't very funny, and I would say maybe even when we're watching this, a few of us uh, even experienced some pain because there was some real truth that was said in there. Do you remember when the woman said to the man, um, you haven't exactly been there for him? You know, later on, they're talking about a, a, a finance meeting, and they're talking about a sales pitch, and they're arguing about which one has to take the kid. Now, you can see that they have their priorities all messed up. Um, you know, I think we watch that, and I think some of us are the kid. You know, we're just trying to get our dad to play catch with us or our mom to, to take us somewhere, and then, you know, some of us might be the parent. We realize that we have missed some opportunities, or maybe we're missing some opportunities. We're exchanging something good or something pretty good, um, you know, for something that is just great, something that's outstanding, something that's phenomenal. Now, have you ever tried to be in a relationship with someone that is just totally busy? 
Like, how does that work out? It doesn't work out very well, does it? Have you ever, like, tried to talk to somebody and, you know, they're sending text messages the entire time? Have you ever, like, gone to the doctor's office and had to wait and wait and wait some more because the doctor is too busy? You know, I think for uh, uh, many of us as families, like, we go from point A to point B to point C, and we run around and we're in all these activities, and we get home, and there's work to do at home, and there's these chores, and there's homework, and there's, there's email, and all this stuff, and, and we discover that we are activity rich and relationship poor. You know, God has created us to live in a relationship with each other. God has created us to live in a relationship with him. Now, God invites us into this relationship through the person of Jesus Christ, but many of us are simply too busy. There's like this census that's going on in our life, and we are too busy, we're too distracted, we're too stressed out to know about the baby who has changed the world and the man who can currently change our world. Now, God says that you should love other people and you should love me. That's the uh, great commandment. God doesn't say, like, be distracted, um, and be busy all the time from the time you wake up from the time you go to bed. God doesn't say push yourself to the limits as far as you can go with stress. God doesn't say have the demands of your life exceed your available resources uh, so you're always burned out. Now, you're going to agree with uh, what I'm going to say. Um, you are. Uh, you know, we're all going to, uh, you know, come to the end of our day sometime and you know, I'm not going to say, like, gosh, I wish I would have just went to one more meeting. Or I wish I would have just wrote in one more piece of uh, literature. Or I wish I would have worked a little bit more. No. What I'm going to say is, I wish I could just have one more long talk with Amber. Now, I love our talks anyway, because I'm a preacher and I'm paid to talk. Uh, she's a therapist and she's paid to listen. So these are like the greatest conversations you could imagine. Or I can say, like, you know, I wish I could uh, go running one more time with Benjamin to Platte River State Park, or I wish, uh, you know, David and I could just play and laugh really hard one more time. That's what I'm going to say. Now, you know, you know that life is too short to be too busy all the time. Now, this is no more evident in any area than our spiritual life in our relationship with God. Hurry simply destroys souls. Busyness is the enemy of closeness and intimacy to God. God tells us to rest. God tells us to connect with him. It is his, you know, rest and connection with God is as indispensable to our soul as water is to our body. You know, we get uh, so caught up um, in the creation of the world that we totally lose track of the creator of the world. I think for most of us, the danger is not that we're going to renounce our faith, and like say, you know, Christianity is bad, it's evil, there's nothing good that comes from that. That is not the biggest danger for most of us. The biggest danger for most of us is because we're so busy, because we're so distracted, because we're so demanded, because there's so much stress, what we're going to do is we're going to settle for a very mediocre version of our faith. What we're going to do is we're going to skim the surface of life instead of fully and abundantly living it. Now, Jesus talks about the fullness of life in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. Now, this is the reason, I mean, if, if you want to know why we have Christmas, uh, let's put it up on the screen. In John, chapter 10, verse 10, uh, the thief comes to steal and kill and take away. Now, Jesus tells us here why he comes. This is why Christmas happens. Jesus comes so that they, that's us, um, may have life and we may have it to the fullness. Jesus did not come to the world so that we can have these average, mediocre lives. Jesus has come to the world so that we may have abundance and fullness in life. Now the thief, the thief has a name. And you know the names of the thief, don't you? The names of the thief are busyness. The names of uh, <coughs> the thief is uh, distraction. The name of uh, the thief is, is stress. What they will do is they will kill our joy. They will uh, uh, steal our contentment. They will destroy our dreams. So what God does is, is he makes an invitation. Like there's this invitation that he makes to me. He makes it to you. He makes it to all of us. He makes it to all of humanity. So I'm going to tell you this. If you're tired, if you're busy, if you are uh, filled up with stress, if sometimes you're just overwhelmed with the demands of life, Jesus has an invitation for you. And we find this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. 
And here the Bible says, come to me. Jesus says this, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now this is an invitation. He doesn't you know, tie us up to a rope and drag us to him. He makes an invitation and invites us to come to him. Now we get to choose whether we uh, respond to that invitation or not. We get to choose whether we're going to place ourselves in environments where we can experience and embrace his grace. And I'll tell you this, rest is not going to be found in your busyness. Rest is going to be found in stillness. The psalmist says in uh, chapter 46, verse 10, he says, be still and know that I am God. It's not like be busy and know that I'm God, be distracted and be, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Like we are human beings, not human doings. We are created to be, not to do. We are created to be in a relationship with God. We are created to be in a relationship with other people. I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, this picture is when I uh, graduated the third time in my life. Um, you can see the Benjamins trying to uh, reel me in there. You can see that uh, we're both a little bit younger there. Um, one of us is a little bit thinner and one's a little bit, uh, never mind. Um, you know, this is probably, what, uh, 2009 or so. And as I look back, this was the busiest time in my life. There, there was no time that I was busier than I was here. Like, we had just started the Water's Edge. Uh, we didn't have a lot of staff. We had some great volunteers that, uh, you know, just made this thing work. But it was a lot of work, uh, a lot of 50, 60, sometimes 70-hour uh, weeks. And then uh, late at night, early in the morning, on the weekends, I was a researcher and a writer. I uh, wrote this 170-page dissertation that's uh, filed in the book stack somewhere on the use of uh, humor in public speaking. Now, this was my graduation day. And... I asked Benny, I said, you know, what do you think about all this? So as a fourth or a fifth grader, he speaks off the cuff and he speaks the truth and that's the way the truth usually comes. And he said something that I, and I've shared this before, he said something that just totally changed my life. You know, the father learned from the son here. He said, Daddy, I'm glad that you're done because now that you're done, maybe we can do more stuff together. You know, I looked at that sheet of paper that had my name on it and everything. I said, this is one expensive sheet of paper. You know, I said yes to something pretty good. And many times I said no to something a whole lot better. Now, I want you to look at that picture again because you're actually in that picture. You know that, don't you? Do you know that you're the guy who's wearing the black robe and the hood? That's you. And you know that the guy behind you uh, is God? You know, just take Craig and Benjamin out of this and put yourself and God up there. And I really think that God is speaking to many of us. Slow down. Just take a break once in a while. Pause. Can you be still? Can you just turn around and come to me and just let me love you? Let me hold you. Let me give you some rest. Let me give you some grace. I promise what I'm going to do is, is good for you. I'm going to give you some focus. I'm going to center you. I'm, going to, I'm not, you know, you can still have your job. You, in fact, you're going to be a whole lot better at that. You can still have your family. In fact, you're going to be better at that too. But come to me. Don't keep pulling away. Don't stay so busy. Don't stay so distracted. Don't stay so unfocused. Don't stay uh, so preoccupied. Don't be so stressed out. Don't be so demanded because this is not why I have come to the world. Now, you might say something like, gosh, I don't have time for this. And I would say, you don't not have time to be still before God. You know, this is the one relationship that is, that is going to last all of us forever. It's the one relationship in this world that can totally revolutionize all the other relationships. Instead of looking at God and saying, God, I'm too busy, let's make a pledge. Let's make a pledge. We're going to look at God and we're going to say, God, I am ready.